Good afternoon, everyone. I trust you're all doing very well. And I have the great pleasure uh, to chair our next session, um, which features the work of two very eminent scholars, and one of them I'm very close to, and that is Joan Rothgarden. I'm close to her, not personally, but close to her because of her groundbreaking work in, uh, in evolutionary biology. Uh, Joan Rothgarden probably is known to most of you, um, but those who don't know her yet, um, some information um, about her biography. It's important to know she had an impressive academic career at the University of Stanford. She taught there about 40 years before she retired. North American professors do not really retire. <laughs> and they go into retirement and become professor emerita, and they still continue to do very good work. And so is the case with Joan, who works on a number of technical issues in evolutionary biology that do not actually pertain to sex, gender, and diversity. But she, of course, continues to have is saying those matters, especially when it comes to the public discourse. Um, from her impressive work, I want to highlight mainly um, books that are accessible to the non-specialists. Uh, and I'm highlighting those books not out of disregard for her other scholarly work, but because those works make quite an impact, even in the scientific community. She published in 2004, Evolution's Rainbow. Um, especially Chuck Drake in that book, I can highly recommend to read. It's a nice summary of her main arguments against what's called sex selection theory and her counter-proposal of the social selection theory in order to overcome a number of really controversial implications drawn from the work of Darwin and modern evolutionary biology. Uh, this book was followed in 2009 with a more, more or less technical addition to what she's done in the Evolution's Rainbow uh, to substantiate her views on social selection theory. It's called The Genial Gene. For those of you who know Dawkins' work on the selfish gene, you can tell uh, it is uh, a polemic counter-proposal. Um, she also published on uh, the relationship between Christianity and science, I think this is a context where this should be mentioned. In 2006, she published the work Evolution and Christian Faith. Welcome, John Rafkan. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come here. Uh, thank you, Gerhard, uh, for all the fabulous work you've done putting this together, and above all, for your vision in uh, thinking of such a diverse uh, set of uh, disciplines and, and participants, and I think that this is going to be, uh, this is going to set a new standard for the interaction of uh, workers on gender with one another and also workers on gender and uh, the religious community. So congratulations. <laughs> and uh, thank you all. There are three topics that I'd like to discuss with you, uh, primarily by showing you slides. I don't wish to go through uh, complicated theories. What I'd like to do is, in a sense, pre-theoretical, just uh, give you, uh, through the use of slides, some uh, intuitive feel for the kind of diversity that exists in the animal kingdom and also uh, among different cultures. And then the third topic would be to connect some of this to some passages in the Bible. So to begin, it's important to remember that not all species uh, reproduce sexually. When people ask, what is the purpose of sex? The normal reply is, well, the purpose of sex is to enable animals to reproduce. But in point of fact, uh, many animals reproduce without any sex at all. And the purpose of sex is different than mere reproduction. It is to combine the genes from different parents together in order to produce an offspring, which has a, a, a synthetic genome uh, composed from the two parents. So it's gene mixing 
which is uh, the purpose, if you will, of sex. So this is a picture right here of some geckos that are found uh, throughout the South Pacific Islands, and it happens that some of these are reproduced asexually. That means that females lay eggs that don't need to be fertilized, and those eggs in turn grow into females again. So there are no males in this species at all, which some of you might find appealing. And, uh, and so some of these species right here uh, do reproduce sexually, and a couple species that reproduce sexually came together and hybridized, producing hybrids, and then the hybrid stock continues to reproduce by itself asexually. So turning from the species that reproduce asexually to those that reproduce sexually, the first question that a, a biologist and that everybody asks is, what's a male and what's a female? And the first point that's obvious is that males and females are not natural categories, as philosophers would say. The natural categories are the egg and the sperm. It's universally true, that is almost 100% true, of the sexually reproducing species that there are only two sizes of gametes. The gametes are the cells that have to fuse with one another in order to make uh, an embryo. This is a picture right here of a human egg and some sperm, which will give you a sense of the relative size of the egg and the sperm. And while it's universally true that species have just eggs and sperm in them, it is not universally true that the whole organism, that the whole body, produces only eggs or sperm. If a, if a body, if the whole body, the whole organism produced only eggs, you could say it was a female. If it produced only sperm, you could say it was a male. But in point of fact, about half of the organisms out there produce both eggs and sperm and can't be uniquely uh, classified as uh, male or female. And you know that right away because you just look outside on this beautiful sunny day and see plants, see trees. And you think about a flower, a flower has, uh, produces um, pollen. The pollen is like the sperm. And then at the bottom of the flower is where the, uh, uh, the egg occurs. And so a perfect flower has both a male part and a female part. So the plant itself is a hermaphrodite, which means it makes both eggs and sperm. And it's true of almost all plants. It's also true of a great many uh, marine invertebrates. And so it's true of starfish, it's true of all sorts of uh, marine invertebrates, but it's also true of vertebrates. And these, this is an example here of a coral reef fish. The panel on the left represents a species in which the small individuals are females, and they, as they grow up, they turn into males, the larger individuals. When I say that they change sex, what that means is that the actual body of the fish goes from making eggs to making sperm. And it's in that sense that it's said to change sex. And that's the, that's the panel on the left. The panel in the middle goes in the opposite direction. In this species, they start out uh, making sperm and then transition into making eggs. And then the panel on the right is one in which the fish produce eggs and sperm simultaneously throughout their lives. And they don't self-fertilize, they cross-fertilize. Sort of do like a little dance right here, like that. And when one is releasing sperm, it's fertilizing the eggs of the other. And then they flip over and then reverse. So, in fact, if you go snorkeling on a coral reef, such as those around Hawaii, 50% of the fish you see are members of species that are either simultaneously or sequentially hermaphroditic. They're simultaneous if they have both eggs and sperm at the same time. They're sequential if they're sex changers, going from male to female or vice versa. So you see that the the binary, the male-female binary, 
doesn't apply universally to whole organisms, but it does apply to the egg and sperm distinction. So that's the place where the generalization occurs. Now, the roles of the males and the females also varies quite a bit across species. In this case, of course, are the uh, seahorses right here. In the seahorses, well, first of all, in fish generally, when there's parental care, the uh, male fish is the one that provides it. The male is the one who defends the territory. And also, male fish will carry the eggs glued, so to speak, to their tummy, or they'll ha keep the, uh, their eggs uh, in, the, in mouth pouches. And in the case of the seahorse, it's derived from a group of fish called the pipefish, as illustrated in the bottom panel. And in the pipefish, uh, the males glue the eggs to the bottom of their uh, tummy. The uh, seahorses are derived from the pipefish. And the seahorses differ from the pipefish in that they have a skin flap on their belly, and the eggs are tucked into the skin flap. So the males uh, wind up having the skin flap, and they become, in a sense, pregnant when the female lays her eggs into the, uh, the sac that the male has. And so this is a picture here, and here's another male with the female uh, laying the eggs into the uh, skin flap. Now this is an interesting situation because uh, this is called sex role reversal by biologists, and it takes place when uh, the males, in this case, are in short supply. It's typical in species to, to imagine that the females are in short supply, the, and because they're tending young or producing young, and the males are busy hunting around looking for eligible females. In this case, it goes the other way around. The, the rate-limiting sex, so to speak, is the males, because uh, females can produce eggs faster than the males can graduate them, and, uh, or give birth, in other words. So, again, we don't have a generalization there about sex roles. Now, another interesting fish that illustrates different sex roles are these angler fish, known for having a spine off the top of their head which they kind of dangle around as though it was a fishing pole with, with a bait at the end of it, and then they can attract another fish and basically fish uh, for their prey. Now these little bumps down at the bottom, down there, they're males. And the big fish is a female. So it's a fisher woman, it's not a fisher man. And the small males are called parasitic males. And what they are is they attach their dwarf males, or parasitic males. And these dwarf males attach to the body of the fish and uh, actually are nurtured by the female through a unified blood system. Now, I've held one of these. I was once at the the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in their fish department. They have all these fish in formaldehyde jars. And, and somebody handed me one of these fish, and it's a, it feels like a golf ball. It's a small little thing like a golf ball, but it has these bumps on it, and these bumps are the males. So this is a female with multiple male mates, so this is polyandry. Now, it's a theoretically significant fish because you often hear biologists say that all males bring to a, a relationship is their sperm, that males don't do anything, they just bring their sperm and the job of raising the offspring and carrying the species forward is all females. Well, if all that males brought to the relationship was their sperm, then they would be dwarf males. Because a dwarf male is basically a ballistic, heat-seeking testes. And that's all that is. But since males obviously are much more than ballistic, heat-seeking testes, then we can assume they bring something else to the relationship in addition to their sperm.
Now I can put this slide in here to illustrate a little bit about the variety of shapes of genitalia across different species. There's a huge variation in what the genital organs actually look like. And I put this in here because of thinking about the slides we saw two days ago on Thursday, which tended to suggest that there's a characteristic shape or almost an ideal shape to a penis and to a vagina and to a clitoris. But considered more generally, there are all sorts of shapes. And, and what's illustrated right here for the top two panels is what's called the pendulous clitoris in the spider monkeys. So these are females, and they show you that the clitoris is used as a, as a signaling organ. You see how it's colored. And there are other species in which this occurs as well. Now, we were informed that a pendulous clitoris is anomalous in a human because that's supposed to indicate uh, excessive masculinization of the clitoris. But in point of fact, the clitoris is often large, like this throughout the animal kingdom, and, or throughout certain groups. The other possibility is where you would have genitalia that would have been classified as uh, feminized. So the bottom panel represents the genital slit on a whale. Now in both whales and dolphins, the males don't have a penis or testicles that hang outside because that would not be very hydrodynamically efficient. Instead, they're tucked up into folds. That's the tip of the, of the penis of a whale, blue whale, and these, are, these penises are huge. <laughs> no one's really made a, a provocative movie about them yet, but you could expect that someday. This genital slit probably represents unfused labia. So the labia didn't fuse to make testicles, and so by not fusing the labia, you wind up getting a nice uh, uh, a canal like this for the penis to, to uh, rest in. I think that calling attention to the uh, shape of the genitals as representing a sort of an anomalous kind of intersex is not very helpful, because from the standpoint of biology and zoology more generally, Genital organs have all sorts of shapes, and there's nothing inherently peculiar about either a pendulous clitoris or an unfused uh, labia. And in other species, these are precisely the traits that are advantageous. Now, turning from individual morphologies and structures to, to social behaviors, we can also ask how a biologist might consider the notions of gender, what the notion of gender might be. If, if we agree that sex refers to the size of the gamete that the organism makes, then what would gender refer to? Well, this is a bird that's found here in Europe called the ruff, which is spelled R-U-F-F. And the males come in three different morphs or shapes. In one type, as shown on the left, the males have a black collar around them. There's also a panel in the middle where they have a white collar, and then there's one at the top right where they have no collar at all. So there are three morphs. The male, the dark colored males, at the time of breeding, come together and make the equivalent of a red light district of males. They, they come together and then, for example, if you, I don't know if you can see from there, but the top of this platform consists of squares, like tiles. Each one of these tiles would be the little court that a black male would occupy. And there'd be a bunch of them here. And when a female, such as in the center bottom, when a female wants to mate, she can fly to this uh, red light district, which is called a, a lek, L-E-K. She can fly to a red light district in, and uh, decide which male she wants to shack up with. The white-collared male, in the meantime, has been flocking with the females all along. So the, the white-collared the white male has been living with the females, 
while the black olive males go and set up a, uh, a territory. Now, at the time of mating, the, the white collared males come with the females to the, to the lek, and the black collared males court the white collared males and solicit them to join them in the territory. So that you wind up getting territories which have a pair of males, a black collared one and a white collared one. And it turns out that the females prefer to mate with a pair of males, namely the black ones and the white ones. And the conjecture reason for that is that the white-collared male can, uh, in a sense, make introductions. The white-collared male has gotten to know the females, knows the males, and he can act as a go-between, a marriage broker, so to speak. Top right, the one without a collar, has not been studied, to my knowledge, as to what its function is in this social system. Now, the plot thickens. The lower right-hand corner shows a black-collared male mounting another male, and, and this, this would be a copulation. So the, the terminology that I've been using is that the different morphs of males are each genders. So I would say that there were three genders of males and one gender of female. And so a mating in the bottom, a mating such as that in the bottom right corner represents a homosexual but heterogenderal courtship and mating. Now another phenomenon, I guess you could say a counterpart to a transgender expression. These are hummingbirds from the Andes in South America. The males uh, typically have this a colored area underneath their bill called a gorgie. And in some species, a fraction of the females have this as well. And also in some species, a fraction of the males don't have them. So that we find in some species, some of the females resembling the males, and some of the males resembling the females. The males and the females turn out to use different types of flowers. The females with the male gorget use the same flowers that the males do, and the males without the gorget use the same flowers that the females do. And this is pretty much a counterpart of a, a transgender phenomenon. And this has been really widely documented throughout the Andes as it pertains to well over 30 species of hummingbirds. Finally, of course, you've heard that there's a lot of same-sex sexuality going on in the animal kingdom, and it's true. Just among vertebrates alone, there are well over 300 species of frequently charismatic vertebrates, such as elephants, giraffes, lions, in which there's same-sex mating that occurs under natural conditions. If we were focusing more on sexuality here than on, than on gender, I would show you some slides about how friendly the uh, courtship is between males who are courting one another and then eventually coming together and mating. This uh, reciprocal exchange of pleasure are the techniques that the animals use to build uh, uh, alliances and uh, friendships, and a lot of friendships, and they're sexually mediated. And so the, what you generally see, both in the, in the geometry of the genitals as well as in the use of the genitals, is that the genitals are multi-purpose structures. And yes, of course, they deliver sperm in a heterosexual mating, but they also have a great deal of social uses. The last slide I have about animals pertains to the implications of this diversity. The implications are for an area of Darwin's work called sexual selection theory. And I'll read this for you because these are direct quotations from Darwin. Darwin asserts that males of almost all animals have stronger passions than females. You notice the almost all animals. And the female, with the rarest of exceptions, is less eager than the male. She is coy. Again, we have with the rarest of exceptions, and we have the phrase coy, the coy female. So these are being asserted as nearly universal characteristics of males and females. Go out of the woods here, pick up a random butterfly. The male is supposed to be passionate, the female is supposed to be coy. 
Darwin's explanation for why male peacocks have the tail is that females choose mates who are more attractive, vigorous, and well-armed, just as man can give beauty to his male poultry. And the reference here, for example, is to like cockfighting, where you can breed a rooster to be a good fighter. And so the idea is that females are themselves responsible for the evolution of the tail in the male, in the male peacock. Uh, I have to critique this, but as you can see, this story of the universal properties of males and females does not begin to coincide with the reality of the diversity in the animal kingdom. You can just, by inspection, look at all the kinds of animals I've just shown you slides of, and they come nowhere close to satisfying this kind of description. So that then leads to the necessity of either fixing up Darwin or discarding Darwin with respect to this topic called sexual selection. I've argued that Darwin should be discarded, that it cannot be fixed. The theory of sexual selection is fatally wrong. Uh, most biologists are apoplectic at my suggesting something so radical. So, so a lot of people are engaged in trying to fix up Darwin. Fine, go for it. It's good money after bad. But you heard it from me first. Uh, if you want to put more time in sexual selection, it's your time. Now let's talk about uh, diversity in human cultures. Now these are slides of North American Indians. The panel on the right is a female warrior, basically a female to male type of person who is living an occupation as a, as a male. And the picture of the warrior here, you see the, uh, the indication of the breast right there. This is the warrior. On the other hand, uh, all the way to the left, you have a rather famous Indian called Ashtish. And collectively, these people are called Two-Spirit because it's the indigenous style of transgender um, expression. What's particularly interesting, I think, about the, the Two-Spirit situation is that the, there's a public coming out ceremony so what's shown right here is a picture of someone who is publicly changing gender and in a ceremonial situation. A, a story that's often told is that in, in some tribes, the, the, the person who's about to change sex will go into a tent. The tent is, put on, is set, set on fire, and then the person has to grab one thing or another. They either grab a spear or they grab a basket. If they grab a basket, they come out and thereafter are identified as female. If they grab a spear, then they come out and identify as male. Now what's important about this is that there's no indigenous sex reassignment surgery that goes on in Native American pe people. Here, your, the markers of your gender identity are expressed through the occupation that you have. And it's publicly known. Moving on to other cultures where, where gender is then more contested, a, a very interesting case involves Joan of Arc, right here. It turns out that she actually was killed because she refused to wear female clothes. She insisted upon wearing male clothes. And they said, if, um, unless you start wearing female clothes, we're going to kill you. And they promptly did. The panel on the right shows a picture of her in armor by a famous artist at the time. Now, people were so incensed at that, that his student was commissioned to redraw the picture with Joan in a petticoat. So they feminized Joan of Arc, even though she died defending her gender uh, expression. And Leslie Feinberg is the person who first pointed this out. I was able to attend a conference in New Delhi several years ago, which was an AIDS outreach conference. And I went there on condition that the organizers uh, take me through some of the shanty towns so that I could inter uh, interview the transgender people there. And this is the shanty town I went to. So this is a picture of the male to female transgender expression in India called 
Hydra, H-I-J-R-A, Hydra. And these girls here are sex workers. These are women here. The woman in white and with the red polka dots is the guru of a clan, if you will, of Hydra. And that's her husband on the left, and that's a younger Hydra on the right, who's a so-called Chila, who's in training. At this uh, conference, there were people, trans people from all throughout Southeast Asia. So these people here are from various countries, like Myanmar, Pakistan, and I have a lot of other slides like this. Everybody likes to take pictures of one another, so I, we've all got pictures of one another. <laughs> the person on the left here is from Guam, and the person on the right is from Hawaii. And the woman from Hawaii, actually the two, two women there from Hawaii, are members of the Mahu group. M-A-H-U is the local name for the male to female transgender expression. It's very interesting, this event on the right, which was on a Valentine's Day, I was attending this show, it was the very opposite of a drag queen show, where in the drag queen show you have mostly guys in the audience and then you have some drag queens, you know, uh, performing. The uh, Mahu gathering right here was a women, a woman's night out. Almost all the audience was women and the entertainers were uh, doing skits and Broadway type music and so forth. Now these are pictures of some Americans. Uh, the person on the left is Gwen Arahu who was killed and the person on the right uh, is a female to male boy really who was killed. The person on the left here is Calpurnia Adams and the person on the right is her boyfriend and her boyfriend was killed because he was accused of being gay because his girlfriend was a trans woman. And then these are a couple activists. You may already have seen the picture of Lynn Conway on the left, a very important transgender activist in the U.S. who's a, an electrical engineer. And the person on the right is Jameson Green, a wonderful guy, uh, F to M, who has written a book called The Visible Man. I show you all these because of this result. The supposition in uh, the, certainly the medical industrial complex, which has assumed control of transgender identity, is that transsexuality is a disease of some sort, and in fact that homosexuality is a disease as well. Now, in evolutionary biology, it's been known for 80 years that there's a connection between the commonness uh, of a presumed disease and how deleterious it is. And it's a pretty obvious relationship. Uh, this is assuming a mutation rate of uh, 1 in 10 to the 6th. If you look at a, at a gene pool, that is the collection of all the genes in the, in the species, the, the commonness of a gene is set by two counteracting forces. One is the rate at which the gene is, being, is arising from mutation, and the other is the rate at which the gene is being eliminated by natural selection. Because if it's a deleterious gene, there will be natural selection against it. And these two forces will come to an equilibrium, come to a point at which they balance each other. In particular, the extreme, if the gene is lethal, the frequency of the gene would be 1 in 1 million, which is the mutation rate. So every occurrence of the gene would be a brand new mutation. So that's one extreme. And the right-hand column shows the percent reduction in Darwinian fitness. That's the way a biologist would measure how bad the disease is. Darwinian fitness is jargon for the product of fertility and probability of survival. It combines both the how many offspring you have with the probability of living to have them. Uh, if we look at the frequency of births for trans people and for gay people, we find in, in the case of gay people about 1 in 10 to 1 in 100, and the, the frequency of trans people is about 0.3% according to the most recent data. So, so that would put them in there. So with this kind of commonness, the percent reduction in Darwinian fitness is minuscule. 
So this is evidence against being able to consider variation in um, sexual orientation or gender expression as deleterious. This, this amount of reduction in Darwinian fitness is insignificantly small. And so that requires, therefore, that, that these traits be viewed instead as adaptations, that there is some positive reason why homosexuality has evolved in our species. And there's some positive reason why uh, transsexuality has evolved. And that turns the whole argument on its head, of course, because now instead of finding out what's the matter with these traits, we have to figure out, well, what's so good about them that they evolved in the first place and would re-evolve if somehow they could ever get eliminated. I'd now like to turn to gender variation in the Bible. Some of the uh, theological speakers the other day said that the Bible is silent on transgender expression, and I think that's uh, incorrect. Instead, the category in the Bible called the eunuchs includes the people that we would call transgender. The Bible has many, many references to eunuchs. And in general, they are extremely positive and inclusionary. And I've summarized some of them here. These are pictures of transgender-looking people that I've photographed in the Cappadocia area of Turkey, and this one from Ethiopia. And the only negative statement about eunuchs is, is in Deuteronomy, where the claim is that no man whose testicles are crushed or whose penis is cut off can belong to the Lord's assembly. On the other hand, Isaiah directly contradicts that, saying, and don't let the eunuch say, I am just a dry tree. The Lord says to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, choose what I desire and remain loyal to my com covenant. In my temple and courts, I will give them a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. Furthermore, there's the interesting statement by Jesus himself in Matthew, who wrote, for there are eunuchs who have been eunuchs from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by other people, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs because of the kingdom of heaven. Those who can accept it, accept it. And the reference here is almost surely to the Sibelian priestesses. This is an excavation from England, a temple to the goddess Sibel. And these are some bracelets being worn, and this is an artist's depiction of what a Sibelian priestess would look like. So these eunuchs are a similar, uh, the, particularly the Sibelian priestesses, seem to me to be an ancient counterpart of the Hijra in India, nearly a dead ringer for it. And finally, of course, we have this extended discussion in Acts about Philip baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch. An angel from the Lord spoke to Philip at noon, take the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he did. Meanwhile, an Ethiopian man was on his way home from Jerusalem. He was a eunuch and an official responsible for the entire treasury of Candace. Now the only way, think about this, the only way that Philip would know this was a eunuch is if he looked different. He has to be gender variant, or otherwise you couldn't tell. This is the only picture I've been able to find in which the eunuch is depicted in a somewhat feminine profile right here. Almost all the art of Philip baptizing the eunuch has the eunuch looking like a big buff guy. Uh, who's being baptized, and that's clearly inaccurate. However, this one doesn't have the race quite right. Uh, this fellow sh should be really dark if he's from Ethiopia, and Philip should be more brown-skinned if he's coming from Palestine. The important point is that uh, Eunuch was reading the prophet Isaiah while he was in the carriage. So the spirit told Philip, approach the carriage and stay with it. So Philip climbs up in the carriage, and they, and they ride along for a while. And as they went down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, water, what would keep me from being baptized? And Philip said to him, 
If you believe with all your heart, you can be. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is God's son. He ordered the carriage to halt, and then both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water where Philip was baptized. Now that's a direct injunction to include gender-variant people in, in the full ministry of the church. Now you'll notice here that there's no qualification on it. It's no qualification such that, oh, we, we'll baptize you if you're celibate, or we'll baptize you uh, if you do this or that or the other thing. No, all you've got to do is believe, and you're in. I think that's an extremely strong uh, mandate for inclusion of gender-variant people. So my final slide is, a, is just frankly a commercial. In the, in the top in the center is a picture of evolution's rainbow. It's been translated into uh, Portuguese and Brazil and uh, Korean, and uh, it's just come out with a 10th anniversary, 10th anniversary edition. And in the upper right-hand corner, there's the genial gene, and that's been translated into French. So thank you so much. If I take the liberty to qualify um, Joan's uh, contribution to our conference, it's actually the first time in the context of our conference that we have good evidence in place now why I believe it is time to overcome a binary ontology as a starting point. So far, this remained a little bit unquestioned. The idea was always, okay, we have the binarism in place, and then we make space in between for other kinds. And I think Joan's work, I really appreciate she brought the religious perspective in as well, gives us good evidence to rethink that starting point, that binarism has any starting point in all this, or as I call it, the binary ontology. So I really thank uh, Joan for that.